Three key factors determine the speed of erosion of a coast. The geology, or the type of rock, that make up the cliffs. The power of the waves hitting the shore. And what happens to the material that's been eroded. Unfortunately for some who live here, Holderness has weak geology, powerful waves, and the material that's taken by the sea doesn't hang around to protect the coast. It's a perfect recipe for rapid erosion. Mike Needley and his family have owned Ringborough Farm near Oldborough for over 50 years. And the problems of erosion are all too familiar. Well, we're stood on uh, an old piggery that we put up in 1973, and this is the remains of it, just the bits, uh, which we've already had to take down and get rid of. Well, the tower will disappear possibly um, next winter, and the other buildings we shall have to take down ourselves. Shot from the tower that's about to fall down, this home video shows just how much land the sea has consumed in the last 20 years. This is the piggery that Mike was standing on and is about to fall into the sea. With its one and a half mile coastline, records show just how quickly Ringborough Farm's being eroded. In 1939, it covered 145 acres. As it loses between one and two meters a year, today, it's not much over half that size and Mike and his family aren't alone. It's all the way down the coast from um, Spain Point up to Flamborough. Um, many farms have already gone in the sea and they've had to either relocate but most of them just pack in and give up. And it's not just farms that are being affected by the erosion. Houses, caravan parks and roads are all regularly taken by the sea. But to find the main reason this part of the world is being eroded so fast, we have to travel back more than 100,000 years. This is what the Holderness coastline looked at the start of the last ice age. A vast bed of chalk extended from where the village of Flamborough is today through Driffield, Cottingham and Beverley and on down past the Humber. But around 100,000 years ago, all that began to change. Then the ice age came and the big sheet came down this way, the big thick sheet of ice, and it deposited the glacial debris underneath it. And when it retreated about 10,000 years ago and it all melted, um, all that debris was left. And basically that's what we stood on now, which is predominantly boulder clay. So most of the 50 miles of our coastline is this fairly soft, unpredictable um, clay-type clay material. And this is what the clay deposits look like today. Because the clay is only loosely bound together, it's easily eroded in three ways. The force of the waves smashing against the clay traps tiny pockets of air that create mini explosions causing particles to become detached. This is called hydraulic action. Stones and other particles that have already been detached also smash into the soft clay, breaking it up. This is called abrasion or corrasion. Hydraulic action and abrasion are called cliff foot processes. But the third process of erosion happens higher up. As the cliff gets weakened by rain, cracks begin to appear at the top. Rainwater gets in and lubricates the cliff material, making it slippery. The weight of the wet clay becomes too much for the cliff to support and it slumps. This is called rotational slip. Working together, the three processes of hydraulic action, abrasion and rotational slip are incredibly powerful. At San Lemire Caravan Park in Tunstall, more than 26 metres of cliff were removed in a single storm in spring 2008. When they installed these bollards in 2007, they thought they'd last another five years. With so much erosion going on along the Holderness coast, the sea is always brown, because the fine muds from the boulder clay get washed out to sea. That means there's very little material around to form a beach, so the waves nearly always reach the cliff base at high tide. 
The stones and shingle are only exposed at low tide. If there were more beach, there would be enough friction to slow the waves down and prevent some of the cliff erosion taking place. But the prevailing winds come from the northeast, and any material that is deposited is continually being moved southwards by a process called longshore drift. Driven by winds and current from the northeast, waves strike the Holderness coastline at an angle, and the swash carries sediment up and along the beach. But when the wave retreats, the backwash pulls the sediments down at right angles. The result is that sand and shingle are slowly moved southwards along the shore. As they're moved around by the sea, any stones or other particles are also smoothed down as they rub against each other, a process called attrition. At the southern end of the Holderness coast, the sea meets the Humber estuary. Here the sand and shingle carried by the sea have been deposited to form a spit or beach that's only connected to land at one end. Known as Spurn Point, the spit performs a vital function in that it protects the Humber estuary from the erosional forces of the sea. It's also been designated a site of special scientific interest, or SSSI, and its bird life attracts twitchers from around the world. It's internationally recognised for its value in nature conservation. The whole of the Humber now is a triple SI. It's a special protection area. The breeding birds on here is interesting. There's only small numbers, but the ones that like sandiums, ring plovers, little terns, oyster catchers. The wintering birds, the mud is really, really important. It's a vast feeding area for all the waders that congregate on there, both on passage and wintering. Dunlin, Knott, Redshank, Bartel Godwits. Again, species which all feed on the mud but have different length bills to probe into the mud for the different foods that they're seeking there. But Spurn Point isn't the only place along the Holderness coast where the interaction between the land and the sea have helped create a bird spotter's paradise. This is Flamborough Head at the northern end of the coast, an area that contains 9% of Europe's chalk cliff coastline and is home to all sorts of birds. Bird life changes throughout the seasons, but at this time of year, April, you'll find a lot of puffins and the guillemots are coming back as well. Then you see the kittiwakes coming in. You've got the range of habitats and species at their northern and southernmost limits. And there's always something of interest to be seen on the headland. The processes of erosion are the same, but here the chalk geology is more resistant than the clay, and it's able to support its own weight. And that has helped create a very different landscape. The cliffs, arches, stacks and offshore platforms are all stages in a sequence of processes that lead to the erosion of the coast. Hydraulic action and abrasion or corrasion create notches around the high water mark at the base of the cliffs, undermining them and eventually causing them to collapse. As the cliffs retreat, they leave offshore platforms behind them. Weaker points, such as joints, faults or bedding planes, are more easily enlarged by erosion, initially forming caves that later develop into arches. If the arches collapse, they create stacks that are eventually eroded down, forming stumps. But it's not just the power of the sea that's eroding the Holderness coast. Like Spurn Point, Flamborough Head is a site of special scientific interest and the birds and natural beauty attract tens of thousands of visitors a year. But having so many visitors puts pressure on the landscape. Even walking across cliffs removes vegetation, exposing the soil to more erosion from rain and wind. But compared to the rest of the coastline, erosion here is still much slower. And for most people living and working along the Holderness coast, the big question is, how can we defend our businesses, homes and lives from the rapidly advancing sea?